back here. Hey, salespeople. Hey. Oh, I got a Hey Jeremy. Can I hear a Hey Jeremy? So I was a sales loft customer for many years before I joined on about a year ago. I'd love to hear uh, just a kind of round of applause for folks who either follow Hey Salespeople or are sales loft customers. All right, all right, super exciting. Well, for those of you who uh, are connected with me on LinkedIn, you probably know that I'm super data driven. I'm a former engineer and statistician. Uh, I want you to know two more things about today. The second is that I am not afraid to swear, unlike David uh, from, from earlier on. And then the third thing is, thank you, when I was putting this together, I was loopy as fuck. So, so I'm gonna give you about fifth, six, thank you, 16 tips in about 25 minutes, so I'm gonna do my best here. That's my thing, I, I, do, I do tips. There's some random stuff scattered about, and just if you like it, great, laugh. If you don't, then you can just be a hater on LinkedIn, I guess, it's totally fine. Uh, I'm old enough. Actually, it's my birthday today. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm old enough that if you hate me, I really don't care. So I I'm going to rant first. As I was putting this thing together, I was kind of looking at our, at our clip art, and I was looking at this, these just little beautiful people, and th this was just what went through my head. And that, that dude is way more attractive, young, handsome than I am. Uh, one of my coworkers who was sitting next to me as I was putting this together decided to, he said, hey, let's try to recreate this. <laughs> the, my favorite part of this is, is our office dog, Prince, is there. That's the photographer's dog. I just look like a total asshole. <laughs> all right, so let, let's get into it. Uh, uh, so haters like to say this. I see this all the time. There are three types of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. We saw some good data, great data, in fact, uh, that Mark presented just before this. I'm gonna steal a lot of that and use that in Hey Salespeople with attribution. But I think there's a, a more subtle truth to this. And I am gonna show you a lot of data. And, and here's the subtle truth. We've all seen the statistic. This came out from CEB, which is now Gartner a few years back, right? Customers are 57% of the way through the purchase process before they have their first meaningful contact with the seller. We've all seen that. And this, this is where people get uptight about statistics, is you, they never really showed what was going on. And it could be either one of these two things. On, the, on your right-hand side, you know, your left-hand side, sorry, is an example of where something averages out to 57%. And that could be that you have two groups of buyers, one group of buyers who had basically uh, not been through their purchasing process, another group who were right towards the end of their purchasing process, it averages out to 57%, even though no one individually or very few people individually are in fact 57% of the way through. The other thing, which is actually more typical, is to have some sort of normal distribution like this looks if you recall your stats classes. That's about as much stats as we'll do. And there you actually have the majority of the people who are actually 57% of the way through the purchasing process and it's pretty narrow. Uh, I don't know what the truth is, I've never seen their exact data, but that's the kind of thing that when you see data, yes, you do need to think through. So just a, a way to think through data, including the stuff that I present you today, is never accept any stat that you see without asking yourself about whether that data makes sense or not. So my little two by two here is, is you can use common sense to figure out whether data resonates with you, or you can just be an idiot about it. Or, and then with respect to data, you can either use data or you can just accept things on blind faith. What I try to do and what I encourage you guys to do as you go through your careers is to look for data and also apply common sense to make sure that makes sense. Uh, you'll often hear correlation does not imply causation. What I'm gonna show you today is all about correlation. It's how things are connected. It does not necessarily imply that there's a cause, but you use your common sense to make sure, huh, does this, does this make sense to me? Okay, you guys with me? Cool, all right, let's get into it. So let's start with cadence design first. So we looked at about 300 million emails. We're now approaching, I think, or have exceeded about a billion interactions between our customers and their prospects. And one thing we found is that you should start with a double touch, phone and email. There's a mildly better correlation with success of replies and or opportunity generation and ultimately wins if you start with a call and then do an email. But frankly, it does not, it's not a huge deal. It's much more important to do the double touch on day one. If you're are you using double, double touches on day one, raise your hand if you guys are, make some noise. Yeah, all right. So that one you guys already know, cool. All right, let's do tip two. So tip two is you wanna provide a bit of breathing room between touches. 
Uh, the, the way to interpret the graph here is that the y-axis is how much time should you wait between touches. So, uh, and then the x-axis is af after touch number whatever. So you see that first data point is at zero, uh, or sorry, is at one. So from touch one, you wait zero days, right? Because you're doing that double touch, it's consistent. I'm not gonna go through every data point, but the way I think of this is what, is what we refer to as the plus one rule. So if you do, let's say a double, t let's just say you're using double touches. You do your double touch on day one, you wait plus one days, that's day two. You add plus one to that, so now we're at plus two, so you're at four. Add three, seven. Add four, 11. Add five, 16, right? So for every, every set of touch or set of touches, you're adding an extra day. And now here comes the common sense part. It's like, why? Why does that matter? And my hypothesis about why that matters is, is people become conditioned to regularity, and if they know you're hitting them whatever every day or every other day or every third day, they sort of tune you out. And so here you're creating a, a sort of pseudo-randomness. It's not exactly random, but their brain can't, the prospect's brain doesn't necessarily detect that you're doing this. And it also shows patience. You know, Mark just before talked a little bit about how important it is to have that sort of personalization. I, th I think there's, there's uh, I feel like there's this sort of transformation coming in sales development, which, uh, which I'll refer to as like slow prospecting. It's not you're going right in for the meeting, go right in for the kill immediately. You have to build value over time. And I, we've noticed that with our own customers, that we've seen a lot of our customers shift to quite a number of LinkedIn or other social touches early on in their cadences to just warm up, right? A like or a share or so on before they go in with any kind of a, of a meeting request or an in-mail or an email or what have you. They're, they're just warming up and, and providing some value. So I, I think that, that um, getting in people's heads is a, is a critical thing. All right, tip number three, uh, inbound. So we, we actually hit 100 different companies for this particular study. We continue to hit companies all the time with inbound. So we'll fill out their demo request forms, track what their response is. So the x-axis here is response time, zero to five minutes from the hour filling out their form to them responding. And then the y-axis is the percentage of companies. So about 40% of companies respond within zero to five minutes. The way that most companies are doing that is to automate that first touch. So with our own inbound, that's exactly what we do at SalesLoft. We, uh, when we get an inbound, we use technology, obviously, to route that into a cadence. And then that first email, even though we recommend personalization, the speed is so critical, that first email, it came inbound anyway, so you don't need to personalize as much, goes out automated with calendar and, and the vast majority of our inbound meetings get booked that way. If the person doesn't engage, then you need to follow that, these, all these great pract best practices around prospecting. Cool? Yeah, all right. Tip four. That's it, I was loopy. 100% of people who pet alligators really shouldn't. That's basically it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I told you, I was loopy as fuck. Uh, all right, so now let's talk about time. There's a lot of research that's been done on like when, what day of the week should you prospect? What time of the day should you prospect? We looked at, in this case, three million emails and we tried to look at which day of the week mattered. And from what you can see here, it basically does not matter when you send an email. Yes, Monday morning happens to be, in this particular set of emails, the best time to send emails, but is anyone really going to just send emails Monday morning and then go home for the rest of the week? No, and just because something is statistically better doesn't mean, it could be statistically better by small amounts. It's not necessarily statistically better by humongous amounts. So my, my takeaway from this is basically the best time to email is now, like, just keep prospecting, I'll always be prospecting. The only bad time to send email is effectively Friday late in the day through Sunday morning. So I doubt you're probably sending very many emails there, although you could set cadences to do that. I wouldn't recommend it. But basically, anything through Sunday night through Friday morning, perfectly, perfectly fine times to send emails. Uh, the same, what, I, what we hadn't really seen, so we, uh, forgive the, the three million emails down here, it's actually 300,000 phone calls we looked at to figure out what the connect rate was. So you're calling out, you're prospecting, we know that phone is incredibly important to successful cadences, uh, and we're trying to look at what was the connect rate. And we define connect rate as you got through, 
and you were able to have a call of at least two minutes. So that's how we define connect rate. So what you see there is the connect rate, if you can kind of barely see it, but that the, most of those bars are floating around 6%. So for every you know, 100 calls you make, you're gonna get about six connects, probably feels about, about right with the way that most SDRs uh, and, and sales professionals feel. There's a little spike there around 12 to one. And this is in the time of day of the caller as opposed to the recipient. So we looked at both sides. Think for a second about like why might there be a spike, and you don't have to answer it, I'll answer it for you, but think for a second about why might there be a spike 12 to one. Yeah, well so uh, that's what we first thought, is like it's lunchtime, except that this is the time zone of the caller. So what, what's actually happening here is, let's say you're calling at like 8 a.m. from the East Coast and you're not thinking about what time zone you're calling into, you're not gonna be connecting on the West Coast. And the flip side is, let's say you're calling at six, you know, five, six p.m. on the West Coast and not thinking about what time zone you're calling into, you're gonna get lower connect rates. So the reason why noon to one is so high is because that's sort of the golden time that everybody you're gonna call, East Coast to West Coast, maybe at their, you know, you have a good chance of being at their desk. If you actually look at this from the other side, and I didn't include it, from the time zone of the recipient, the rate is basically a flat 6% between about 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. So the same story as with email applies to phone, which is like, don't, don't, don't overthink it, just frickin' call. Uh, and, and really, any time anytime is the right time. I think it's kind of BS. You hear these things about you should call decision makers like before 9 a.m. or after 5 p.m. The data does not actually support that with hundreds and, in this case, 300,000 phone calls that we track from our prospects. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about. Uh, let, let's get into emails. So we've done uh, a lot of data science now on looking at emails. Most of these come from a sample of about three million emails. The first thing is how long should your subject lines be? And you can see subject lines here ranging from zero to obscenely long subject lines. The 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 highest response rate. So the way to, the way to read this is the boost in response rate over whatever your baseline is. So like if, you're, uh, if your baseline is 5%, then sending one word email subject lines would get you an 87% higher response rate over the five. So five times one point, you know, I'll roughly double it. It's like eight or 9% response rate. So one word subject lines are the best. The question I often get is what is, the one, what is that magic one word? The, so the magic one word is, um, it, it doesn't, the, the magic one word is it mostly is your own company name. And I'll, I'll prove that to you in a second, but that tends to be the best. Uh, there are other ones, even greetings like hello works well, there are other ones, but just kind of stick to one word and think about it, right? You're making, the, the logic here, the common sense is you're making it easy and effortless in the mind of the prospect. And, and effort is always, is, you know, is always helpful when people get scores and scores of emails every day. As you see, you can go up to about four word subject lines before it really starts to drop off. So you don't want to exceed about four words in your, in your subject lines. I was actually really happy that the, the, zero, the zero means the subject line was blank. And I was really happy, because like, I mean, I try to be as ethical and conscientious of a person as I can be, and it would have been kind of horrifying to me to see that zero word subject lines were, were effective, because it's a super deceptive thing, right, to send an empty subject line. So they, like, they're okay, but fortunately the one word, uh, two and th three and four word subject lines trump that. All right, um, so here's what we was talking about, that one, the one word thing. So we looked, you know what subject lines you guys will often craft You'll think about, do I put their, the recipient company name in there? Do I put my own company name in there? Do I put their first name? And over time, different things work, right? I mean, these things work for now. They can change over time as your prospects begin to notice and become immune to these. But at least right now, using the sender company name, so your own company name as that one word, or if you have a multi-word company name, that's okay, uh, has a significantly higher response rate than, say, using the recipient's company name. So people are immune now to seeing their own company name in the email. They know it's kind of marketing spam. Uh, and then even using their first name, which we looked at as well, is actually quite bad now. So if you're, if you're using first names in subject lines, please stop doing that. It doesn't work. 
Uh, unless you're our competition, then go ahead, do that. <laughs> Uh, tip number eight. So this is, this is the single highest response rate of anything that you can do in the subject line. It's also the hardest thing to do, which is kind of obvious. If you are referred in, then, and we detect that also from subject lines by like recommended by, referred by, it's all kinds of keywords, then you get a 5x increase in response rate. It's obviously not just the subject line, it's the body, it's the fact that you were referred in. Like the common sense kind of works here, but referrals remain the, the single best thing that you can do. And you know, referrals can come from a lot of sources. Referrals can be referrals from your existing customers. Referrals can be people that you're connected to within your company, right? You just be really creative about the way to use referrals. Anything warm that you can use to get you in is, is effective. Um, one super interesting thing that's related to referrals, but not as exactly referrals. I got. A, uh, I'm just thinking about all the ways people have prospected me over the years, and one of the most interesting ones that was sent to me was. Uh, someone sent, not to me, and this is think about slow prospecting, they sent to our uh, CFO, hey, should I be talking to Jeremy? And then our CFO forwarded that on to me. Like that's a super clever, slow prospecting way to get in. And it's, it's in referral-esque, but, uh, you know, but you have to be patient. Like those sorts of things really, really do work. All right. Um, there's a reason I use hey, salespeople. And it's because of this data, which is we looked at the salutation in the emails. So now we've moved on from subject lines to salutations. And we looked at hey, hi, hello, or just using people's first names in subject lines. And we found this significant bump. Again, there's about 3 million emails behind this. A significant bump in the reply rates when people used hey. So we at SalesLoft switched all of our, uh, all of our cadences to use hey, first name instead. Uh, I've seen this kind of ripple through the industry. The good, the good news is people got, have been getting lift out of this. The bad news is once everyone starts doing this, then we all probably have to switch it up to hi or hello or, or Saudi or whatever it happens to be. Um, so at least it's working for now. All right, tip 10. You will hear throughout this conference, you heard it from Mark uh, before me, that personalization wins. I think this is one of those evergreen things. I don't think this goes away. What we did was we looked at the percentage of, per how much do you actually need to personalize? The way we did this was with uh, you know, any sales engagement tool, you can load a template in and then you customize the template. So we looked at what percentage of templates got customized overall. So a 0% customization would be they just used the template, maybe there were some dynamic tags in there or whatever, right? But that's still, I would still consider that 0% personalization. All the way through to the salesperson decided to blow away the entire template and 100% personalize it. They just deleted it and rewrote it. The, the reason why, so, so, and then what you see basically is that the, the probability of an email reply rate goes up, 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 until you hit about 20% personalization. And yes, that 20% could be anywhere, but it's likely in the, it's very often in the very beginning of the email, as you would expect. And then kind of flattens off, which means over 20% personalization, you're basically wasting your time. And then it rolls off once you hit about 80% pretty aggressively. And you know, we're, the, the most curious thing, the first part I think is not curious to me. I think there's two lessons here. One is, is this thing about stop after you get to about 20% personalization. We've watched how long it takes people to do that. And once they've done their research and actually start editing the template, that takes about five minutes, plus or minus, five to 10 minutes. So you don't have to go crazy with it. And then the other, I think, interesting thing is don't blow away your templates. And if you think, right, if you think about it, those templates were, were probably A-B tested, well thought through, and if you go and blow it away, you're, you're basically losing all the benefit of what you could have learned you know, from, your, from your sales leadership, sales ops, and so on. Yeah, I'll take a question. Quick question. Uh, is it personalization to the person or to the company? Great. Yeah, so I'll repeat the question. It's a really, really good question, which is like, is it personalization to the person or the company? So uh, we do a Hey Salespeople podcast, and I had a, I don't know if this one's out yet, but I interviewed this person from Corporate Visions, uh, and they had done a piece of research where they looked at three types of personalization. One type was, uh, was like industry or role personalization. One type was, I'll call it individual personalization, about them as a person. And then the third thing was personalization around their company. Like you went through their 10K or 10Q or investor presentation or what have you, and, and looked at their company. And, and they found that the highest response rate, so you can sort of think for yourself which one it would be, uh, they found that the highest response rate was actually industry or role personalization as opposed to company or individual personalization. 
And, what, and the way that, that their common sense explanation for, for that research was that when you personalize on, on their, themselves as an individual, again, people are, are skeptical, like, you don't know me. You don't, you, right? Maybe, maybe you went to their school or had some other affiliation, which is probably okay, but otherwise, like, you don't know me, and I'm gonna dismiss you. The same thing with company is, is you can miss the mark on the company because that person may not share the initiative that you read about. It may not be their thing. Uh, and they're also skeptical, like, you don't know my company. So skepticism was the thing that they, um, that they said was the emotion that was behind the, the sort of lower response rates around those types of personalization. The, the role or industry one where you're sharing a trend or a best practice, the, the, the term, the emotion they used for that was voyeurism, that, that people want to know and want to learn about what other people are doing that's successful. So if you're going to personalize and you believe that research, which I, I think does resonate with me, use industry or role, uh, use industry or role personalization. Great question, thank you. All right, a uh, bunch of tips, four minutes and 42 seconds, I will do it. Uh, tip 11, keep your email short. So we looked at the length of the actual body of the email, stripping out the salutation and then any of the confidentiality notices and all that. And we found that emails basically up to 100 words are effective. The sweet spot is 26 to 50 words. I don't think you have to be like super literal about it, but long emails don't work. That one, again, common sense. People on their mobile phones, they're scanning quickly. If it's a short email that you don't have to scroll through, you're much more likely to get them to read as opposed to give up. So I think that one, that one follows a, a lot of common sense. Uh, yeah, another random tip for you guys. All right. The last is, I've shown you a lot of data from SalesLoft, but I don't think that's the only great source of data. And, you, and you'll see on the Hey Salespeople tips that I put out, if you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, do connect with me, you'll get those uh, and no, no fluff every day. The, these tips are actually from other, other sources, which I think are really great sources to follow. So one of my favorite people to follow on the planet, I don't know if he's here, I haven't seen him around today, is Chris Orlob. Uh, Chris is amazing and produces just some of the best research out there. Uh, and this one is, they looked at, uh, his company looked at conversations that were happening and found that top reps, kind of unsurprisingly, are much more likely to respond to objections with questions. I listen to a lot of call recordings, and a lot of times reps are so eager to jump in and, and combat the objection, they don't take time to clarify the objection. And I, so I just remember for yourselves, even though you think, yeah, I always ask, I always respond with questions, like, no, you, you probably don't and you should take the time to, to just step back and uh, respond with a question. They also found, I don't think this is in here, that if you maintain your rate of speech, volume, pace, and so on, through the objection, as opposed to getting excitable in response, then you have much, much better outcomes. So just sort of think about remaining conversational as you are objection handling. Number 13, which is, uh, I thought was super interesting. So 45% of buyers want ideas up front, 47% of buyers want them after they express their needs. My takeaway from this is basically buyers want tips and ideas and best practices all the time. I find that a lot of sellers like to give insights at the very beginning, and then once they're engaged in the sales process, it sort of trails off. Just from, this is the, the key takeaway here is basically keep like loading ammunition and firing great ideas and best practices for like how to use your product, those industry and role insights that we talked about earlier, just keep adding value throughout the course of the sales process so that the, you're viewed as a trusted partner. Because as we know, there's a million solutions out there. They all do basically the same thing. And what's gonna distinguish you and get you to win is, is whether they trust that you're the person to help them succeed on their, on their key initiative. Uh, I love this one too, uh, which is humility wins. You know, you, the old school, I don't know if it's even true, but the old school sort of personification of a salesperson is like this aggressive extrovert. Um, and you know, and I, I love the fact that 91% of, of top reps with medium to high scores on humility, uh, you know, basically are, are winning. So I think that was a, a, a super useful thing. This is complex, and there's a common sense piece here, which is, there is a little bit of a tweak here also, which is that uh, another corporate executive board thing from the challenger sale basically says that you, like, you need to be willing to, to sort of help your customer, your prospect move along. So find that line between that subtle pressure to keep the deal moving along and the humility. All right, uh, sales is hard work. Basically sales has a 1% close rate. So for all those ops you guys generate, one in 100 is gonna close. It's, it's, it's disappointing, but it is what it is. 
And then last but not least is um, sales is all about discipline. We, we've looked at our, our customers and you know, the, the single distinguishing thing between the top SDR organizations and the average SDR organizations is that the top organizations, and I, I kind of hate this, but I know it works, hold their people accountable, every person every day to a call target. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of draconian thing, but I will tell you if you're not doing that today, I, I leave that one with you uh, as my final piece of advice, which is um, whether you're held, whether you're an SDR and you're held to it or not, the person with like the most activity wins, and it's not just the activity, it's because you're getting as many repetitions and as much practice and feedback as you possibly can. So you know, if you want to be the best salesperson on the planet, be the person learning the most and with the highest activity. That's all I got. Thank you.